Hello and welcome to this amazing presentation. What's the point of this? I'm really just looking over um, the land-based empires. There it is. There it is, is what I mean to say. The land-based empires, uh, looking over topic 3.1, 3.2, and 3.3, because so much of our last couple weeks before this test have been eaten up by half days and days off and PSAT and all that. So I want to give an overview. It should be able to help you broadly with what you need to know for the multiple choice, giving you examples of what you could use for SAQs and LEQs. So go through the whole thing. Take notes like it's actually a lecture. All right. Um, some of this is going to be a short review of what we've talked about already with 3.1 and 3.2. So just write down what you need as needed. So let's look at Topic 3.1, which is about empires expanding. I'm going to look at each one of these learning objectives. If there's any examples, some specifics you need to know about, remind you about a couple things, take notes as needed. A lot of the stuff you need to take notes on is you're actually going to have to listen to what I'm saying and write it down. All right. So what's the first learning objective? Explain how and why various land-based empires developed and expanded from 1450. So what are we looking at here? Of all the empires we learn about, you need to know a little bit about how they started, how they're able to stay centralized, administer their empire or state. Um, so a little bit of their origin stories, a little bit of vocabulary about them that you need to know. I'll give you some examples looking at the Qing dynasty in China and the Russian empire as an example. So just a reminder, this map is from Freemanpedia. It's a, an invaluable resource. You really need to be looking at Freemanpedia. He's got a lot of great graphic organizers, some maps to tell you about things. But we'll look at each one of these. But just a reminder, we've got the Aztecs, the Incas, the Songhai, the various gunpowder empires, the Chinese empires, Russia. And on here, they've even listed a lot of the uh, large and important buildings, which are ways that rulers legitimize their rules by having large monumental architecture and art and all that stuff. And he's got examples of them all over, so that's great. All right, so the first historical development, gunpowder. Okay, imperial expansion relied on the increased use of gunpowder, cannons, and armed trade to establish large empires in both hemispheres. So you should be able to tell me that when the Russians conquer into the steppes in Siberia, they're doing that with gunpowder. More importantly, you should know about the various gunpowder empires, the Ottomans, the Safavids, the Mughals. Their conquest comes with the use of gunpowder. Also, how do we finally stop you know, the, the steppe nomads from invading many places? Gunpowder, cannons, guns, okay? Um, so anyway, just know that gunpowder technology, cannons, protecting trade is very, very important. If you wrote an essay about it or you had to write an SAQ about how it was that these uh, empires were able to expand and maintain, gunpowder technology is very important for that. Okay. Next, let's talk about which empires you need to know. Next, historical development. Land empires included the Manchu in Central and East Asia, the Mughal in South and Central Asia, the Ottoman in Southern Europe, the Middle East and North Africa, and the Safavids in the Middle East, mainly Persia. So know what these land empires are called. Know where they were. We can break this down by region, by the way. What are the empires you need to know? Europe, you have Russia. Now, of course, Russia is primarily in Asia, but, you know, ethnically a European empire. You have East Asia. You have the Ming and Qing dynasty. We'll be focusing primarily on the Qing. You also have the Tokugawa shogunate in Japan. Now, I haven't spent much time in class on the Tokugawa shogunate, but it is there, and you do need to know about it. The Islamic world, you have the three gunpowder empires, the Ottoman, the Safavid, which are here, and the Mughal, which are here. You have the Songhai in West Africa. They're not really a gunpowder empire. And also, um, it's really the elites who convert to Islam in Songhai. The Songhai are very much a continuation of the Mali Empire. And then don't forget, in the Americas, you also have the Aztecs and the Incas still going strong for a half second before conquistadors show up. Lastly, 
Another historical development is political and religious disputes, which lead to rivalries and conflicts between states. The best example here is between the Shia gunpowder empire of the Safavid and the Sunni gunpowder empire of the Ottomans and this area of conflict they'll have in their border regions and the area of conflict that the, uh, the Safavid will have with the Mughals in their border region. This is exacerbated by the fact that the Safavids were very much Shia, while the rest of the Muslim world was predominantly Sunni. But we also see these religious disputes echoed in the Thirty Years' War in Europe between Protestants and Catholics, so it's there. So this is from Freemanpedia, Too Long Didn't Read. A ton of new land empires pop up in this period. You need to know the Ottomans, Safavids, Mughals, Manchu, and Russians. Also, don't forget about the Incas and Aztecs. You need to know about their expansions, so you need to know their beginnings. These are big empires that will last for, last for many units going forward. Don't skip this section. Remember, the Qing will last till 1912, the Ottomans till the end of World War I in 1918. So a lot of these go into, you know, 100 years ago. As an example, let's spend a little time talking about Russia, how they originated, how they expanded really quickly. So Russia, remember, Moscow became the dominant city in Russia. You could think of them as little city-states or principalities, however you want to think of it. But remember, the Mongols had conquered this and turned Russia into the Golden Horde. Now, after the plague is going to weaken the various Mongol Khanates, eventually the Russians will oust the Mongols. Moscow being the dominant city will start to expand outward and conquer. They expand into the west bringing in the different uh the different uh Slavic speaking like ethnically Russian areas, but then they conquer south. Now why do they conquer south? The primary reason besides, you know, just conquest and and getting more land and all that. The primary reason that our book talks about is security. This is the area of their enemies where the steppe nomads had been terrorizing them for so long. So they're putting down um they're conquering into here so that they can have security now they also conquer east into siberia why do they conquer east into siberia fur okay fur trade is very important the animals here have thick pelts they can be killed you can use their fur it's referred to as quote unquote soft gold remember as they conquer they spread their culture with them the russian language eastern orthodox christianity um also Isolated tribes that weren't exposed to domesticated animals don't have immunities to various diseases. So you're also going to see many Siberians dying from uh, epidemics caused by the various contagious diseases that Europeans and most Asians had already been exposed to. What about China? Well, technically, the Ming Dynasty exists in this time period. We've already talked about the Mings, uh, about Zheng He and his voyages. So let's focus on the Qing. The Qing start when the Manchus invade south into China and they will set up a dynasty called the Qing dynasty that will last all the way until 1912. Um, remember they're noticed for their distinctive hairstyles in which they shave here and then have this long braid called it a Q. They're technically outsiders in China, right? Because they're, an, they're another nomadic group that had conquered in. But they very quickly adopt a lot of the Chinese practices. Confucianism, the idea of the bureaucracy, foot binding continues. So in many ways, this is very much China as usual, even though it is an occupier who has conquered China. What's not China as usual is China very much becomes an empire. China has been really one of the oldest nation states historically. They had an ethnically homogenous population of Han Chinese. There are different dialects, but they're all kind of under the umbrella of being Chinese. The practice of Chinese styles of Buddhism, the practice of native Taoism and Confucianism, all of this had historically defined China and really East Asia broadly, but now they are going to conquer into the steppes as well as the Russians did. They're going to do this for security and they're going to extend their empire much farther west and north into present day Mongolia and Tibet. Many of these areas are still under Chinese control today. Let's spend a little time again reminding you about the gunpowder empires. You have the Ottomans, the Safavids, the Mughals, there are some similarities, some differences. They all deal with some specific religious things. The Mughals are Muslim, but they're predominantly um, ruling non-Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, etc. 
The Ottomans are predominantly Muslim, but they have a large Christian population since they've conquered so much of Europe and some of the Christian areas of the Middle East. And so they have large Jewish and Christian populations as well. The Safavids are predominantly Muslim, but they're Shia. And let's not forget over here in Africa, you have the Songhai. And the Songhai, the Songhai um, are going to be predominantly Muslim, but it's really just the elites. So much like the Mughals, ruled over non-Muslims, but the leaders were Muslim. You could compare the Songhai, also had Muslim leaders, but most of the people underneath them in West Africa weren't Muslim. AP loves comparisons. This is the kind of thing you're going to see on a multiple choice question, on an LEQ, on an SAQ, okay? Comparing the different religious makeup of these places, the fact that the Mughals and the and this, uh, Songhai and the Ottomans had to deal with pretty large non-Muslim populations while they were ruled by Muslims. What do these gunpowder empires have in common, though, too? Not only do they use gunpowder weapons, they're ethnically related. They're all uh, steppe nomads, Turkic peoples from Central Asia. So let's talk about topic 3.2, how empires were administered. Finally. All of that that we've been through so far has really just been a review because I went over that more fully in class. But hey, maybe you weren't listening. First learning objective for this, explain how rulers used a variety of methods to legitimize and consolidate their power in land-based empires from 1450 to 1750. Same time period, same um, concept of land-based empires, but now it's how did people legitimize their rule? How did they get power, keep it, consolidate it? There are many ways, and we're going to learn examples now. First, the recruitment and use of bureaucratic elites, as well as the development of military professionals, became more common among rulers who wanted to maintain centralized control over their population and resources. There are many examples of this. We'll look at a few. But, you know, just think about the Dev Shirme system, the use of Janissaries in the Ottoman Empire, salaried samurai in the Tokugawa shogunate, the fact of just building these large standing armies, the military professionals, um, again, the expansion of bureaucracy and the continuation of bureaucracy like we see in the Qing dynasty. Nothing new with bureaucracy in China there. Let's look at some specific examples. So we have the Dev Shirme system. This was the Ottoman Empire's practice of taking Christian boys, it's sometimes called a blood tax, every few years, and they would kidnap them and make them serve in the government, either as the elite forces of Janissaries or as bureaucrats. They are converted to Islam. They are kind of just, they just become Turkish in a way, right? They're converted to Islam. They learn to speak Turkish. Um, and those who can cut it will end up being in the Janissaries. It's terrible. And you can imagine, you know, can, you know, if you had a child and the males were kidnapped, that wouldn't be too great, as you see in the picture here of the women crying. However, although it's terrible, it is an example of upward mobility in which um, Christians who were still, they were tolerated, but they were second-class citizens. Remember, they had to pay the jizya and all that. They, this is a chance for their sons might have a better life. Now, their culture, in many ways, is being taken away from them. Um, their, you know... Greek is being replaced by Turkish culture. Uh, Christianity is being replaced by Islam. So, you know, this would be what we would consider a war crime in, in modern day history. But hey, let's go to the next learning objective. And, and by the way, on that previous one, realize there are many examples of building up armies. The Dev Shirme and the Janissaries this is just a great example the College Board picks on uh, because it's such a clear cut example in which. Governments are like, we need a military. What can we do? Let's subjugate our people and let's build our military. Okay. The next learning objective. Rulers, and this is nothing new, rulers continued to use religious ideas, art, and monumental architecture to legitimize their rule. This is a term that College Board loves for the WAP test. Legitimize their rule. How do people legitimize their rule? We've talked a lot about using religion to legitimize your rule, whether it's the divine right of kings, whether it's the Chinese idea of the mandate of heaven, whether it's the idea that pharaohs were god kings, whether it's the idea that early Roman emperors were deified kind of as demigods. We see all throughout history that rulers will use religion to legitimize their power. But they don't just use religion. They also use art. They also use monumental architecture here. Okay? Anyone know this is an example of? Anyone? 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 
Yes, Versailles. That's right. You in the back. So let's look at some examples that College Board specifically picks out for us. One example of a religious idea is the Mexica. Now, the Mexica are the larger tribe which the Aztec are a part of. Um, College Board, I think, wants to clearly show that the Aztecs weren't everything in Mesoamerica, that broadly what becomes Mexico is from this tribe of people known colloquially as the Mexica, right? But when we say Mexica, for the most part, the largest centralized Mexica state are the Aztecs. So we're talking about the Aztecs, but there's a broader tribe of people in the Mexica. Anyway, the Mexica very famously practiced human sacrifice, and in the Aztecs, you were forced to pay tribute in the form of humans to be sacrificed. Wars were fought so that um, prisoners of war could be captured and brought to be sacrificed, and that's an example of using religious ideas to legitimize your authority. Priests and rulers would preside over this. It was said that they were basically uh, appeasing the gods by having human sacrifice and so this gives them a lot of power and this is done like high on the temples it's done by a special priestly class to do it so this is an example of using religion to legitimize your rule another example what's happening in europe at this time the divine right of kings and if you have forgotten what the divine right of kings is it was this concept that god basically had ordained who would be the kings in western europe um, it ties a lot into Catholicism, Catholicism, and then later on we're gonna. There will be some examples we have it with Protestantism, but for the most part, we're thinking like you know Louis the Fourteenth and other rulers throughout Europe. Uh, the divine right of kings is basically you know God has chosen my dynastic family to be the leader of this place, and it shouldn't be questioned. And that's an example of using religious ideas to legitimize your rule. Any more? Why, yes, there are. Elites would frequently adopt a new religion. This is like when Russian uh, leaders adopted uh, Eastern Orthodox from the Byzantine Empire to legitimize their rule as this new important religion. The Songhai in West Africa are going to adopt Islam. And what's interesting about this, as I've already mentioned, is most of the people living in the Songhai Empire who aren't elites will not convert to Islam. They will continue to practice native religions, um, animistic, shamanistic, Bantu religions. And today, this is one of you know the largest growing areas for Islam and Christianity. And so you have a lot of missionary activity still in Western Europe, or Western Europe, Western Africa. What about using art and monumental architecture? Well, the Qing begin to commission these very intricate imperial portraits and so you can just think, why would these you know, grand paintings and portraits uh, legitimize their rule? Well, look at them in silk, seated on a throne. They clearly have a lot of power. You can put these up in your kingdom. It legitimizes your rule. What else? Well, the Inca will build these large buildings. One of the most famous ones is going to be the uh, Incan Sun Temple. It's in Cusco. And there's astronomical things with this. And so you can look up more information on that if you want. But again, it's a great example of building a large, intricate, monumental architecture. It shows that your government is centralized. It's large, and so it impresses commoners. You can take this all the way back to, you know, the step pyramids throughout Mesoamerica, the Roman Colosseum, the pyramids at Giza. Throughout history and civilization, rulers have built these large, monumental architecture pieces, and it makes them show off their power and when people come and visit and trade there when commoners are walking in the street they see these large buildings built by their government and they're reminded of the power of their government and this legitimizes the government's rule very famously we've talked about the Taj Mahal which was a mausoleum a mausoleum to Shah Jahan's uh, wife right and look at this it's just so impressive so it's going to show the power of this ruler also all throughout north uh, india especially and what will become like pakistan and bangladesh you're going to see these large mosques built during the time of the mughal empire and then over in western europe you have the very famous place if you ever get a chance to visit it it's extremely impressive it is versailles this palace outside of paris that we'll have for louis the 14th and I have some images of Versailles, but I mean, it is just very extravagant. Let's ooh and ah. Look at those gardens. 
I remember being in here on an Assassin's Creed game. That's fancy. Okay. Next learning objective. Rulers use tribute collection, tax farming, and innovative tax collection systems to generate revenue in order to forward state power and expansion. That is a lot, but it's basically saying, how did the government get money? They got the money from collecting tribute, and it wasn't just money, it's also goods, or it could be human sacrifice victims. Oh, sorry, not victims, Um, honorees. Tribute collection, tax farming, and tax farming is exactly what it sounds like. It's where you give a percentage of the crops you grow um, as a payment of tax, and just straight up tax collection systems. And so let's look at the various examples of that. Uh, in the Mughal Empire, you have these aristocrats, and it's the Persian word, I think, for landholder. I could be wrong about that, but they're called the Zamindars, and the Zamindars ruled locally and collected taxes, and those taxes then went up to the central government. You have something similar with pashas in the Ottoman Empire, not just the Mediterranean restaurant. The Ottoman Empire practiced tax farming when a percentage of crops were given up to the government. Something that we also saw like in feudalism in Europe. So this is nothing new, but it is a great example that you could write about or have a multiple choice question about when it had to deal with how it is that rulers, you know, maintained their empire. One way was that they collected revenue in the form of tax uh, collection. For example, the Ottoman Empire uh, practiced tax farming in which a percentage of uh, crops grown had to be given to the government. Okay, so this is why I, I share this with you so that you can use it as evidence in your papers. Uh, the Mexica, the Aztecs, had tribute lists in which they were given things like animal skins, people, certain goods, tortoise shells, uh, rubber balls, etc. And one that's going to become really important, especially in Unit 4, where the when the Spanish discovered this large mountain of silver in modern-day Bolivia, is that the Ming Dynasty, so we're Ming, we're before the Qing, the Ming Dynasty switched their tax collection service into hard currency, predominantly silver. And what that's going to mean is, uh, it's going to cause lots of problems, but it's, it's also going to mean that the government itself is actually making um, a lot of bullion which is gold and silver bullion will be going into their treasury so this is more advanced than using like tax farming right it's going to have large implications though because it's going to force peasants to start making more luxury goods because peasants had historically been doing more of a tax farming giving a percentage of their um a percentage of their crops up to the government they might sell some of their crops but now many peasants will start doing a there's just no better word. They'll start doing a side hustle, and I guess that's two words. Whatever. They'll start doing a side hustle, and um, they'll start making luxury goods uh, like silk so that they can sell it, so that they can get silver, so that they can pay taxes, and it causes some problems. Finally, let's talk about topic 3.3. 3.4 is just a comparison where it just reiterates the, the various ways people administered, religious beliefs, all that other thing of the different empires. So let's spend a little time here. Explain continuity and change within the various belief systems during the period from 1450 to 1750. There's a lot of continuity, like Islam and Christianity are there. Islam is still the dominant religion of the Middle East, North, um, North, South Asia, the northern part of South Asia, what becomes like Pakistan, Bangladesh, Kashmir, etc. Uh, North Africa, uh, the Middle East, Persia. Um, but a change is it's going to move now into Anatolia, modern day Turkey. It's going to move. It keeps moving west into West Africa. It moves into the Balkans. Christianity is still the dominant um, belief system in, in Europe. However, it's now going to fracture between Catholics and Protestants. It's also going to be spreading to other parts of the world, like the Americas and uh, the Indian and Pacific Ocean regions, going from the Americas to the Philippines. So there is a lot of continuity and change with the belief systems here. We also are going to see the rise of a new belief system of Sikhism, combining elements of Islam and uh, Hinduism. There's also these various movements like um, 
the Wahhabi movement, which is a more fundamentalist form of Islam, or is going to start towards the end of this period. So a lot's happening with religious continuity and change. What are the examples we need to know about? The most important one, besides that Safavid and Ottoman Sunni Shia issue, is the Protestant Reformation. So the Protestant Reformation marked a break with existing Christian traditions, and both the Protestant and Catholic Reformations contributed to the growth of Christianity. So the Protestant Reformation, it's starting with Martin Luther. He's going to be protesting the church, and he wants to reform it, but he ends up creating his own branch of Christianity and that's, it'll fall under the umbrella term of Protestant. And pretty soon, Protestantism splinters all over. It's going to lead to religious conflict. What are the religious conflicts it's going to lead to? Um, there's going to be fighting, uh, especially like killing of the Huguenot in France, which is going to lead to the Edict of Nantes, N-A-N-T-E-S, um, in which there's going to be more religious tolerations between Catholics and Protestants in France. It's going to lead to the Thirty Years' War, which will end with the peace of Westphalia, which will end for at least a, for a pretty, for the most part, large-scale religious violence between different Christian groups in Europe. And so there's going to be a lot of violence coming from the Reformation. It's also going to affect the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church stops the sale of indulgences. They create new orders such as the Jesuits. They increase their missionary activity. They have a counter-Reformation. They create the Inquisition to punish heretics. And then while this is all happening, remember, Europe is now discovering, you know, in quotes, it was already there, but they're discovering the Americas. And so as they colonize parts of the Americas, parts later, parts of Africa, parts of the Indian Ocean region, they're going to spread their form of Christianity, be it Catholicism or Protestantism, all around the globe. I guess I should have mentioned a lot of that stuff during this slide, so I'm probably just going to delete it. And here we can get a zoom in on that map where you see clearly where all the different religious beliefs are. You can see where the Huguenot centers are, all the violence, etc. Here's another map of that a little bit later. It shows maybe a better blended version of everything. Here is where you can look at like early Christianity, how it splits into all the various churches. This starts way, way back, you know, even splitting with, <coughs> excuse me, splitting with um, Coptic, uh, Eastern Orthodox, Catholic, etc. The next learning objective, political rivalries between the Ottoman and Safavid empires intensified the split within Islam between Sunni and Shia. I don't think I need to spend that long of time on this because we've gone over it before in the previous one, talking about the gunpowder empires. But just to reiterate, the Safavid are Shia. They're going to uh, send out Shia missionaries, and they are going to slaughter Sunnis whenever they conquer modern-day Persia. That is going to intensify the political and religious rivalries between Sunni and Shia. We can still see this really echoed in today, with Iran being a predominantly Shia nation, and many of the places around them being predominantly Sunni. And here you have, like, the farther away you get from Iran, there are little pockets of, of Shia all around the world. But for the most part, you have Iran kind of being that island of Shia in a, in a world of Sunni. Next, there is this religious tradition, Sikhism. Sikhism develops in South Asia. And it is an interaction between Hinduism from South Asia and Islam, which is brought to South Asia through trade and conquest and Sufi missionaries. And so with the Delhi Sultanate and then various Turkic king kingdoms and sultanates until finally you get Tamerlane and then the Mughal Empire, you're going to have this strong presence of Islam, especially in northern India. And so we're going to see in the, in the Punjab region, you're going to get a blending of this, and that makes Sikhism. WAP loves Sikhism because it's such a perfect example of that fancy word syncretism, in which two or more religions or philosophies are combined. And since Sikhism has a belief of like, you know, one universal God, but then also a belief in reincarnation, you can clearly see it's been influenced by Hinduism and Islam. A little bit more on Sikhism. It's founded by Guru Nanak. There's no way I'm going to pronounce that correctly, so why do I try? Blends Hindu and Muslim elements. It ignores caste distinctions. It ends the seclusion of women. It promotes the equality of men and women. And so that makes it different. You're also going to see that Sikhs will be persecuted. Um, 
you know, not being Hindu and not being Muslim, they are then going to be a religious minority. And so religious minorities get persecuted because that's what people do. We'll also see, I might as well plant this flag here, that Sikhs will frequently become um, parts of the different, like, warrior groups. And so you'll see in really overwhelming percentages, you'll have six, like, when the English are in India, you'll have six um, serving uh, in the English military. Uh, you'll have six working as bodyguards and stuff like that. And so your book will talk about this, especially that this is a reaction because of like, you know, not wanting to be a persecuted groups. The six really would concentrate on, you know, warrior and self-defense and that kind of stuff to this day. Okay. Um, what else? I think that's pretty much it.